What's up guys, it's Austin North here from Outer Banks and we are gonna be diving into episode five. If you haven't watched it yet, uh, don't watch this video because we're talking spoilers and everything else involved. When I first read it in the script, I, I, I thought it would be hard that Kiara isn't just immediately defending him as like, let's get out of here. But with speaking to, to the creators, I mean, it's very much, Kiara's in a position where she's still trying to build trust with her parents right now. Like, she gets back, they welcome her with open arms and she's trying to balance building back trust with her parents and being there for her friends in this journey. Um, when I first read that moment, I thought it was, it was, it was hard that, that you know she doesn't just jump in immediately, but in a, in a way, like Kiara's used to her dad just like yelling and saying things, and I think she just tries to brush it off and doesn't realize how hard it hit for him. I'm, I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure that was me, and I think again it was just like a. I think it was an audible, like where we just, just you're just in the scene, and he's leaving, and you're you're sort of just feeling like, what would JJ do? Like he's just been, you know, he's just been insulted sort of by the father, and he, it just seemed like that's what he would. Do. Yeah, yeah, and so right. I, I, that's like a lot of the stuff that we, you know, it seems like a lot of the best stuff too. You're just in the scene, you feel it. Like what and just what would the character do and what's you know also and also just what's the most you know what gives us the most juice you know going forward and you know obviously jj totally sabotaging you know what you know when he gets on the motorcycle and he looks back and you know you know she smiles at him and you know that's something you know eventually she's going to find out what happened um you know, it's just you you feel like this sort of tragic situation it's just there's a time bomb, you know, the bomb beneath the table. Yeah, uh, I think this is just a dig. I think JJ just, I think a little bit of uh, uh, younger JJ comes through in that scene because he's, uh, except also adult JJ when he like bites down on his tongue because I think he could have said a lot of other things and he decides not to. But then when he hears Mike say something that really grinds his teeth, he uh, he's just like, he just can't help himself. He just can't help himself and be like, all right, you're going to talk. I'll do something. Do something back. What's up? Why? What are you on? But yeah. I feel like if I ask you, just like, the, like just the person that you are. You I mean the, the person I am? No, I didn't mean it like that. I, I guess I mean, you're such a giver, Topper. You're just such a helper. And I feel like if I ask you, that's, you're going to feel like you... Sarah, that's just, that's just who I am. That's just the way I was raised. And anyway, remember when I said I would do literally anything for you? You remember that? Yeah. I meant it. Unlike some people who will just say whatever to get you to go along with whatever they want, I'm not that person, okay? When I say something, I mean it. I need your truck. My, like wheels. my dad's truck? So yeah, the moments when Sarah is coming to Topper asking for his help um, to get the cross, which means uh, essentially helping the Pogues, uh, essentially helping John B. It's a tough moment for him, but at the end of the day, he truly has those feelings for Sarah still. He wants to help her, still has that love for her. And he's, I think he's matured a lot. He's grown a lot as a human, and he, he's kind of beyond the high school drama and, and the, the BS between John B. And he's, you know, there's people's lives at risk now, and he just wants to be there for Sarah and help and uh, put his self aside and his feelings aside in this episode. Poor Topper, like, like damn, like, she just, she just milks him or anything, I was like, she's being heartless again. Like she's pulling all the heartstrings. But it was also really fun too, because Austin is so fun to work with, and he's so hilarious, and he's such a he's such a honest actor. And um, I think he did an incredible job with Topper this season. But it was really funny because I didn't want it to f come across as too like manipulative, even though it is. Um, I wanted it to. I wanted to kind of make fun of it a little bit. So we, um, Jonas and I were like, let's play along. So maybe like the Pogues are like in Sarah's island and they're like egging her on. They're like, yeah, like, you know, at the very, and we, we see that, which I'm happy about, makes it kind of, like adds a bit of humor to it. And um, 
You know, and like Sarah and Topper have known each other for a really long time, so it was a brief moment to catch up and, you know, maybe like kind of foreshadows like what's to come in the season. Hey! What? Just so you know, I'm not normally this crazy. It's just getting this cross back. It means a lot to me. I have to do this. So the scene with the Pogues where we're on the train, the heist is happening, it was a lot of fun. When we got the script, I was very nervous how it's gonna all turn out. There's a lot of different action sequences, um, but I think it turned out really well. Um, it's a new adventure for Topper. He's you know grown up getting good grades, his mom wants him to get into college, and now he's putting a lot at jeopardy by breaking the law and being on the run, and the cops are after him. A lot of adrenaline, there's a whole thrill involved, which I think he's kind of intrigued with, and it's something different for him, which I think helps him understand why Sarah's been on this journey with the Pogues, and it's just this wild, you know, free adventure. It's very irresponsible. Would not recommend doing anything like this in real life, but uh, Topper's, mate, he's, he's kind of a Pogue in this episode. That was interesting, um, because I that episode I wear these really tight pants that were amazing and looked really cute, but they were not functional at all. So like at least six times a night they had to ring me a new pair of pants because all of Cleo's stunts, like I had to jump on stuff and like do flips and stuff and every time the, the pants would, would rip. <laughs> so every time I think of the heist, I think of those pants and they did not do well. <laughs> in extreme circumstances. Yeah, that whole sequence is really, really fun. You know, train heist, I was like, wow, like another huge action moment and, and a different one for us, you know, like we're on a train, you know, there's parts where the train is moving and and uh, Cleo and Pope are clinging onto it. Like, you know, a lot of really, really intense moments and a lot of, um, a lot of beats of like suspense, you know, and, and just um, working again, like I haven't really worked with Austin since uh, season one. Like I really didn't see him season two. So getting to work with him, he's he's like he's a riot. He makes me laugh so hard. So those days when he when he's there, I'm just like, we, me and him are both cutting up the entire time. One of the things that we that's strange about our show is that we don't cheat a whole lot. We don't do a whole lot of visual effects. So we tend to do everything for real. So that was all hard and slow. So much ad adventure and um, there's our our part of um, stopping the train with jumper cables. And we, we, we played around with that a little bit. I mean, before it was pretty straightforward. He did it and then it worked. And then we kind of built this moment of him doing it and it not working and us like trying to like figure out how to make it work, building just more tension there. So I like the way that that got reworked a little. Well, this doesn't happen every day. You see a train get, uh, yeah, you see a life, full life train just stop. Yeah, it's a, it's a fun moment just to be like, wow. This is how the sausage is made, and I get to watch it happen. You know what? I'm not buying it. I'm sorry. I'm calling for backup. Sir, please. I, I see that you're married. Sir, please. please. We're, we're in love. That's all we're trying to do. We're just trying to get married, and we can't do that here. Please. Uh, what? Our parents won't let us be together, but... Sir, we, uh, we can't get married in this town. That was so much fun. There was a lot of improv in that scene. Like, a lot of improv in that scene. It was great, because it was like... All, all the train high scenes were all overnight. So it was like three, four, five o'clock in the morning and we're, you know, doing this scene and it was just me and JD, like Jonas was like, you know, just rift with each other, just rift with each other. So we would just like, we just would stand there and just keep going, like the camera would just keep rolling and we would just keep going back and forth and I would kiss him and then he would take it off and we would like, there's stuff that didn't make it, but like there was a point when I like was like, yeah, you see we're together and then I kissed him and then I like, like, rub it on my shirt. I was like, this is gross, you know, don't ever touch me again. And then, um, you know, transitioning from that train heist into that car, that car chase sequence with, you know, uh, JJ, I, Austin, that stunt double is, is a killer on the bike. So, you know, he's doing all those, um, those bike moves and those tricks and, and, and really, really uh, brought his all. You know, he, he specializes in like uh, the dirt bike and the motorcycle part of uh, stunts. So, you know, he was excited to be able to do it and watching uh, that kind of happen and watching him do his thing was really, really cool. And just seeing them like build these like moments with the cops and like the moments where the bike kind of falls, like, you know, a lot of, a lot of really good moments in that sequence. Being able to, they had the motorcycle that is like tra chasing Topper's truck. Um, they had it attached 
to the car. So everyone's in the truck and me and Rudy are on the motorcycle. And it was like cool to, to do that stunt sort of, of, of jumping to the, um, to the truck. It was cool. That was also hectic. <laughs> Um, it was fun. That was really fun. It was really, really cool. Um, Madison and Rudy's stunt was really, really badass. <laughs> Selfishly, I was really happy that I was placed in the front seat of the car with air conditioning. So I didn't have to move and I was just sat in a very nice civil environment. And there were really bad mosquitoes that day. Everybody was just getting eaten alive and I was just in the comfort of a truck cab. So I was happy about it. The making of it is all very um, intricate, like a well-oiled machine, and they're night shoots, so they're very, um, they have a very like delusional, unhinged energy, so um, just a lot going on, but very fun. It was like eight straight full nights. It was brutal. It was, it was some long nights. All of that was nights, so it was like 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. kind of hours for a week straight. <laughs> Again, another confusion on set was just like, how does he, how does he escape? <laughs> There's a moment where we're like, wait, how does he get away? Uh, <laughs> and I think we kind of came up with that actually on the day, uh, a little bit. They, they were because like we had different roads, you know, and it was hard to find the right road. I don't think we had the proper roadage is the term I'm going to say, uh, which is not a word. But um, yeah, we had to like make shift like uh, a proper overpass and all this stuff. Um, so it was a little bit of confusion, but at the same time, it's so fun to play a character that's like doing fun stunts like that on the run, on the escape, and you know, trying to portray a motorcycle chase. Blast again. Well, I just really wanted the moment to be there. The, that line without what I say, um, what I say there felt too casual without there being any sort of like gravity to what could have just happened. Um, and I just feel like we, have, we, don't, we don't really have moments like that, Sarah and JJ. Um, so I wanted to add it. Like, Sarah's one of the pogues, I think. What the hell? We did. Of course, you're still fake. Pope, I'm so sorry. Uh, he's utterly devastated. You know, like he he really can't believe it. He's just kind of stuck there. He did all this, and not all, and all this, not just the train high sequence, but if you're going back to when he found the diary and he realize he realizes what that cross means to him and his family. Like from there, from that point on, he's 100 percent determined to make sure he gets it and that it's, that story is kind of like told and, and his family is given the respect that it deserves. To go from the pure moment of elation of like, hey, we did it, we got it, like the plan worked, like the, the plan goes smooth, it has the hiccups, but it, 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 you know, generally speaking, like they, they did the thing they set out to do. And that box opens, you know, I talked to Jonas about it and he was just like, it's utter devastation. Yeah, it's, again, it's just a bunch of letdowns and like it's frustration. It's also thinking of Pope. That was post redemption moment a little bit of where he's like, I can finally get back and finally have what's mine and we can somehow get this to the right person. And uh, you have to feel for Pope in that moment. Trying to like put all those emotions into that, like it was a really intense kind of moment to think about. Like, man, this kid, this poor kid cannot catch a break. He just can't, you know, none of them can, but especially like him. like. Everything that he wants, he doesn't get the girl, he doesn't get the cross, he doesn't get a scholarship, he gets nothing. And at that point, all of those things come and hit him at one time. When that box opens, it's like all of your dreams are gone. And uh, I think JJ also is like on an adrenaline high of like, we just still need to get out of here though, dude. Like we still need to go out of here. But Hope's frustration in that scene was, you know, you can't imagine. Just kind of really playing into that like that, again, like I say it again, like that utter de devastation was just, it was really, really it was intense. <laughs> I, really, well, I really wanted to see the actual heist because you see this heist happen with the Pogues and Topper and it's this extravagant, like 
insanely planned event, and then they finally get it, and they realize that another heist has taken place before. It's like, I really wish, it would be cool to see like, like a director's cut of like Rafe and Barry, and just a couple goons like in bandanas, just be like, how are we gonna do this? We going to hell, that's for sure. Ray's such a great character because he he can just he can just do horrible things, um, you know, like melt the cross down, just like awful. Rafe melting the cross was a what the hell moment of like okay how am I gonna justify this you know again I think it's a moment of him pushing himself to the brink you know I, I think he's very you know there's no middle ground for him it's either it's either all or nothing which you know i mean that's the whole that's part of the reason why the decisions he makes are so like have such crazy intense outcomes but like yeah i mean i think i think he feels like he's at he's at the brink he doesn't he doesn't have any other options left um so he has to do something drastic um, I mean, even even Barry in that moment is like, I don't know about this. You know, when Barry is the voice of reason, something's wrong. Uh, Rafe needs to sit in a room with a clinical professional and talk to someone for a minute. Like, but yeah, Barry's Barry's Rafe's therapist at the end of the day. But yeah, it, it's cool, obviously, to play like that heightened. Something that heightened is is always like a really fun, fun way to go about it.